you'd, you'd like to talk about yourself as a, as a naturalist as opposed to a scientist. Um, what's the difference? Science is very factual oriented and that's good. I'm not saying there's anything against that, but what's missing in so many uh, eth ethological scientists is this sense of wonder and awe and not wanting everything to be explained because some things never can be explained. I'm pretty sure about that. I've seen the films of you climbing up trees and trying to um, get a glimpse of chimps, but we've gotten so used to the Attenborough documentaries where we're so up close to every species that we kind of take it for granted how hard it was to even see a chimp. Uh, the early observations were all through binoculars you know, from a reasonable distance. And I was getting really worried because it was money for six months. And I knew if I didn't see sort of exciting things before the money ran out, that would be the end of the dream. Well, that was my goal as a child, to live with wild animals and write books about them. That was, that was the whole goal that I had. You, in your new book and, and in some of your other books, you dedicate, you, you make a dedication to, um, a primate named David Greybeard, who became, I guess, along with Louis Leakey, was one of the most important primates in your life because he, he sort of opened the door for you, correct? Uh, yes, do you have a picture of him there? He was very handsome. Tell me about David's uh, contribution to your, to your mission. Well, David's, David contributed in many ways, first of all, by letting me get close to him. But the real breakthrough was seeing David using and making tools, uh, grass stems to fish termites from their underground burrows. You know, at the time it was thought humans and only humans used and made tools. And that was what enabled Leakey to go to the geographic. They agreed that they fund the research when that six months money ran out. And they sent a filmmaker, Hugo van Lauwick, who was able to document the behavior that I was gradually learning more and more about as the other chimps came to accept me as well. You were, of course, studying uh, chimpanzees as mothers. Uh, you had a bunch of role models that you could look at. Um, could you talk about a couple of the mother chimps and what you learned from them? But what I really got from the chimps were two important things. One, they had fun with their infants. They played with them. Mm -hmm. They laughed. And I thought, I'm going to have fun with my baby too. And the other thing was the tremendous importance of support in the first couple of years, which is really important for our children too. So to have, to have a little group, two or three supportive adults who are always there, continuity for the child, who give that child confidence. When you had your son and he was with you, um, at least a lot of the time in Africa, um, Grub, as, as you call, call him, do you still call him Grub uh, at, yeah. at, the, at this stage? Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. good. Sometimes the Grub. nickname just sticks. And now that brings me to um, the Book of Hope, um, which is uh, called A Survival Guide for Trying Times. Wonderful timing, Jane. We do <laughs> need some hope right now. We do. <laughs> this book and hope is so important now is because if you don't have hope then why bother to do anything if you don't think that what you do is going to make a difference why bother to do it why not just sit back eat drink and be merry for tomorrow we die and <laughs> you know so if if we don't get together and take action then no oh, i think our race our, our species is doomed People in their individual lives are beginning to think about, you know, how you behave and what you buy and did it harm the environment? Was it cruel to animals? Is it cheap because of f unfair wages or, or um, forced labor? And if so, don't buy it. So, you know, we're, we're really beginning to use our brains to leave lighter ecological footprints. When I was growing up, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, so it was the era of the space program and National Geographic and Jane Goodall. What could we do to bring those good old days back where kids grow up um, not distrusting science, but, but loving it? 
you know, I meet like a CEO whose company is really damaging the environment. And how do you, how do you get, how do you get through to that person? It isn't any good pointing fingers, blaming, arguing, because then the brain of that man is going to be refuting you and finding, thinking of ways that he can refute you. And I think people must change from within. And so the way to get into a person's heart is by telling stories. Just out of curiosity, where does your energy come from? I mean, I am exhausted just thinking about all the things you do. Um, what what um, pushes you forward? You know, as I get older, I'm nearly, nearly um, 88 now. I, I've got less time left. So I have to do more and more and more because there's so much to do. But the main thing is to inspire others. And the Jane Goodall Institute's 24 around the world, the Roots and Shoots groups, thousands of young people, and all the ones who've been through it and take the values with them, respect for all life. This is actually a conversation I've waited my entire life to have. You're one of my heroes and you're the hero of millions of others. So uh, I just wanna send you my gratitude and my love. Well, thank you too. And you know, it's been really lovely talking to you. And I hope that when I'm next over, your side of the Atlantic, we can meet in person and share a whiskey. I will hold you to that. <laughs>